It's my pleasure this evening to introduce Malcolm Brenner, who's the, who's the 2011 E. Donald Thomas lecturer. I have a special privilege of knowing Malcolm Brenner actually longer than anybody else in this room. Um, we go back actually to medical school times. Uh, he was a student and I was a, a young resident. Bone marrow transplantation was just in its infancy in those days, as you can imagine, all those years ago, and I won't embarrass anybody by telling you how long ago it was. And as an enthusiastic young uh, registrar, as we were then called in England, I was teaching a small tutorial group of students about bone marrow transplantation, and I thought I was doing very well. And there was a very studious, serious student at the back who had been listening, taking notes, and then he looked up and he said, uh, I just need to ask a question. What is the basis of tolerance in allogeneic bone marrow transplantation? This is a question, uh, the answer to which I don't know more than 30 years later. So that was how I first came across Malcolm. So Malcolm's career can be split up after the medical school period, uh, where we shared the professorial medical unit uh, with some of the first transplants uh, uh, in the Westminster Hospital in London. Um, his career thereafter can be split into three sections which have each been marked by milestones in discovery and development. The years that he spent in London at the Royal Free Hospital, he described a lot of very fundamental characteristics of immune recovery after stem cell transplantation, described the recovery, the early recovery of natural killer cells, the delayed recovery of antibodies and specific responses to uh, viral and bacterial antigens, and then um, went on to move to St. Jude's Hospital, where he was one of the first to use gene transfer to demonstrate, as we all feared, that the seeds of relapse could lurk in the autograft infusion. And that hard training into the intricacies of regulatory control stood him in good stead for his last move to Baylor College of Medicine, where he and his team have led the field in the development of antigen-specific T cells for treating viral diseases and for treating lymphomas, and many of these cellular products are already in clinical use. So I think Malcolm is the perfect model of the clinician scientist, somebody who, like E. Donald Thomas before him, worked out the immunological principles and applied them to improving therapy in a practical way. So it's with great pleasure that I welcome Malcolm Brenner as the 2011 E. Donald Thomas lecturer, and his title is Shepherding New Cell Therapies Through the Valley of Death. Malcolm. So, uh... I have uh, no financial conflicts of interest to declare, and that in a nutshell is the tragedy of cell therapy. <laughs> so I'd like to thank John for his uh, introduction. Uh, I'll explain what this title means in a moment, but um, he, John was too discreet to explain that I'm actually a, a pinch hitter, a sort of understudy uh, for the original speaker here. So I want to apologize to those of you who are disappointed uh, that I'm here. Uh, I think some of you will be feeling that you were promised a sort of delightful evening with uh, someone glamorous and exciting, a sort of uh, thinking person's lady, Diana. Uh, and instead, you've ended up with someone who's a bit closer, apparently, to uh, Lady Camilla. <laughs> but um, I hope by the end of my presentation, you'll realize that you've actually got someone quite different. Uh, and. <laughs> and that you'll see the importance of cell and gene therapy of CAGT uh, to bone marrow transplantation, and it's remarkable, indeed, it's almost transformative powers. <laughs> so let me begin by uh, uh, establishing my credentials. Uh, uh, as you heard from John, I, I really started uh, stem cell transplantation about 35 years ago with, with, with John's help. Uh, and at that time, we were, of course, all very influenced by Don Thomas's uh, early protocols. Uh, 
I, I actually became a house officer or intern at Westminster Hospital in 1975, and, and John didn't tell you this, but the Westminster Hospital was really one of the very first places in the UK to be doing stem cell transplantation. He also didn't tell you that at that time the bone marrow transplant program was run and organized by this uh, rather terrifying, uh, rather charismatic figure who only much later would become uh, the John Barrett that we know today. <laughs> John, John had spent a lot of time developing the bone marrow transplant program there, and he influenced me to join in and, and help him look after some of Britain's first stem cell transplant patients. And because the protocols were based on Don Thomas's early work, I became very familiar very quickly uh, with what was going on uh, in, in the area and came to appreciate uh, the novelty of the innovation. Anyway, the experience of being trained by the president of the society uh, meant that for the next 10 years I avoided stem cell transplantation altogether. Uh, instead, I focused on getting a PhD in Cambridge in immunology where I met my wife, Cleona Rooney, who became my collaborator later on, uh, and trained in clinical uh, immunology in general. By 1984, however, I, I'd come to appreciate that many of the issues that prevented bone marrow transplantation from being safe and effective uh, were immunological issues and um, I joined the Royal Free Hospital as a kind of wannabe hematologist. Um, at that time, Grant Prentice was uh, one of the major innovators of uh, T-cell depletion and immunological manipulation of the graft, and I was able to help, uh, as you heard, him build a, a translational research program. So while I was at the Royal Free, I met this sort of young, uh, I suppose you'd be called an economic migrant now, from New Zealand called Helen Heslop. And uh, Helen came from a, a very remote, very isolated part of New Zealand and spoke in this very thick sort of ethnic vernacular, which was extremely difficult to comprehend, but we persisted with her. And in the end, uh, we managed to communicate, and she came to join my lab as a kind of postgraduate fellow. This, this picture was taken in 1984, so more than 25 years ago, and we've changed a lot since then, but in case you're wondering, Helen is the one on the right. It was really while I was at the Royal Free that we came to appreciate just what was happening to bone marrow transplant in terms of concept. So the initial concept, of course, was that the graft was simply a means of rescuing patients from chemoradiotherapy, uh, that uh, in, in disease it was the, it was the treatment uh, and not the bone marrow rescue that benefited the patient. Subsequently, we entered the kind of second conceptual phase where we understood that the graft was actually an effector mechanism in its own right and had its own uh, immunological properties. And the third phase, which really began in the late 80s, was the concept that the stem cell transplant was an actual portal through which cellular therapies and stem cell therapies could be introduced uh, and made more beneficial and more effective for the patient. So really, what I think Don Thomas had produced in his initiation of stem cell transplantation was the beginnings of what might be called complex biological therapies, or what are called in Europe advanced therapy medicinal products. Now what we mean by these complex biologics uh, is essentially three components. They can be gene transfer vectors, they can be somatic cells, or they can be engineered tissue or any uh, mixture of the three. And they're complex because when you're administering them, you have to consider the biology of the cells, the vector, the transgene, the immune response to the vector, and also the physiological responses to the modified product, uh, and also to the transgene as well. Um, what this means is that they are of increasing complexity as you go from non-viral vectors at one end through to gene-modified tissues uh, at the far end. And as you go up this kind of scale of complexity, the similarity to the pharmaceutical model uh, progressively declines. And they're not pharmaceutical or, or less and less like pharmaceuticals for a number of reasons. First of all, they become increasingly individualized. Uh, secondly, because they're complex, it's very unusual to be able to take something straight through phase one, phase two, phase three, as you can with a small molecule or abandon it on the way. Instead, you have to do sequential phase one studies, then back to the lab, of course, modify the components and try and optimize them. That's very difficult for a, a drug company to tolerate that kind of open-ended commitment and, and even harder for a, a small biotech company. Because they're complex uh, in com composition, the intellectual properties complex, difficult 
difficult to license from multiple agencies, and there are these problems with stacked royalties. And then the other problem is high cost of goods. Although we can manufacture these more cheaply now, as I'll mention briefly later on, uh, nonetheless, they are never going to fit the ideal pharmaceutical model where you spend most of your money up front in getting the drug approved, licensed, and then you manufacture each dose for a few fractions of a penny for, and, and sell it ideally for many hundreds of dollars. That's, that's not really going to happen uh, in that way. So this is a problem because if we look at the development of standard drugs, what we see is that as we move along the development pathway from preclinical discovery through to phase three a clinical trial and, and eventual approval, uh, what happens is that the academic involvement generally declines. And the reason it declines is because the amount of funding required progressively increases, and this has to come more and more from commercial interests. Now, for the reasons I've just described with the development of complex biologic therapeutics, uh, academic involvement has to remain much longer because of the, the various complexities. Uh, nonetheless, unfortunately for academic funding, this actually goes down the further along the development path where you get relatively easy to get funding for basic science discoveries relatively uh, and for early phase clinical trials, much harder for the kind of process development and late phase clinical trials that are essential uh, for getting a drug approved. So what this means uh, is that many of the people who try and move drugs through from discovery, complex biologics through from discovery into the clinic, find themselves entering the valley of death from which many of the agents and sometimes many of the investigators uh, fail to emerge. So you might say, why, why do we have to follow the pharmaceutical model? Why can't we just accept that these new complex therapies are just going to be another form of bone marrow transplantation or any other uh, complex, high-level, destination-type medicine? Well, the answer is, unfortunately, that, that over the past years, the ability to introduce these uh, agents into clinical practice in the same way as before has become much more difficult. The regulatory and the financial environment are much more hostile now. It's very difficult, for example, if bone marrow transplantation were just starting today, it's very difficult to see how any institutional review board would be tolerant of the high mortality and morbidity that was associated with the procedure. So how do we, how do we pass through the valley? If I can just stay with the biblical metaphors just, just a little bit longer, what we have to do is two things, really. We have to, first of all, show that on the other side of the valley, there really is the promised land, that we really are going to be able to develop agents that are substantially and significantly better than those currently available. We cannot have incremental advances alone, a few weeks longer life in a small percentage of patients, because it's simply not going to be worth the effort of transferring all the resources into these complex biologics. And if we find that the, the land of milk and honey really does exist, then we have to find a way of shepherding these protocols uh, through the complex uh, valley and, and into approval. And that's really what I want to deal with for the next, uh, next 20 minutes or so. And let me begin with making complex biologics worth the effort. For them to be worth the effort, we really have to do four things. We have to show that they are better. In phase one studies, we have to show that they are effective. We have to make them work broadly. In other words, we have to take a platform and by making relatively small adjustments to that, be able to treat a new range of diseases. Otherwise, again, if you have to go back to the beginning and redevelop all this complexity right from the start every time, it's, it's not going to be feasible. We need to make them simpler. We need to bring the cost of goods down and the, and the simplicity of manufacture down in process development and so on. And we need to make them very safe for, for a variety of reasons, some good and some not so good. Um, cellular and particularly genetic therapies are very highly scrutinized and the tolerance of adverse effects is very low. So I'm going to give examples of how we've been trying to do this really over the past 20 years. And I'm going to use examples that have already been presented during this meeting because I, I, I think that I would just like to go over them fairly superficially and try and explain how they fit into the context of, of what I've been trying to talk about and explain to you here. And let me begin by explaining how we try to make them or show that they're better. Really, this story begins 20 years ago when I was at St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and had a lab there between 1990 and 97. And we became interested uh, in EBV-associated malignancies, in particular in type 3 latency, uh, which occurs in patients who are very immunocompromised, such as after bone marrow transplantation. It's the cause of lymphoproliferative disease, post-transplant lymphoma, 
and it expresses a very wide array of EBV antigens, including some that are extremely powerful and stimulatory to the immune response. The only reason that this can exist in patients is because of the extreme immunocompromise. Um, we got interested in this for two reasons. First of all, because it was a clinical problem. It was killing about 10 to 15 percent of our patients uh, who were receiving T-cell depleted uh, unrelated donor marrow. We had no CD20 antibody or any other therapy at that time. And secondly, because uh, Cleo Rooney was uh, an EB virologist and so had some uh, ideas for how we could uh, approach the treatment. So what we did then was uh, cultured the donor's peripheral blood mononuclear cells with Epstein-Barr virus, turned them into lymphoblastoid cell lines, which express the same set of antigens that the tumors that arise in these patients express. Uh, and then we cultured those with fresh peripheral blood mononuclear cells uh, to generate cytotoxic T lymphocytes, CTLs, that were specific for the broad array of EBV antigens. And then because we thought that it would be important to know the fate of these cells and show that they were plentiful, that they proliferated, that they remained present for a long time, uh, and that they uh, entered the sites of tumors, we used gene marking, not gene therapy, but gene transfer with a neomycin resistance vector so that we could track the cells in vivo. And I'll just go through this quickly, but I think it's important because it kind of sets the scene for, for everything that, that followed thereafter. And so what we found was very rapid expansion, just giving tiny numbers of cells, 10 million, 20 million cells, we could see a 10,000-fold expansion in seven to 10 days uh, of the cells in vivo. We could see the cells persisted now out well beyond uh, 10 years. We could show, as you can see there, the marker gene present uh, in the tissues. Uh, and uh, importantly, they worked, and they worked in patients who, even those who were resistant to available therapies, uh, and they worked both peripherally and, as shown here, in the central nervous system. And overall, more than 100 patients who received these cells as prophylaxis, none of them uh, developed uh, Epstein-Barr virus-associated uh, malignancy, as opposed to about 10 to 15 percent of the controls, and we had complete and sustained responses in 10 of 12 individuals. This has proved to be cost-effective and transportable to other centers, uh, and Helen uh, Heslock obtained uh, orphan drug designation a few years ago, and we're working now to try and get it a licensed and approved product for reasons that I'll come to at the end. So the question really is, why did this work so well? And, and that's something that we, we addressed and, and need to keep addressing, I think, as we go forward. It's much more accepted now that lymphodepletion is an important part of cellular therapy, but at that time it, it was quite unknown. And I think that the reasons, though, are obvious, which are that we were transferring both helper and effector T cells, uh, that the environment post-transplant favors homeostatic expansion. Uh, there was an absence of negative regulators, including but not limited to T regulatory cells. And we have antigen remaining in the host or appearing in the host, which is uh, presented on residual antigen presenting cells. And all those factors uh, are important in the observed benefits. So then we asked, could we make this work in a broader range of disorders? And this uh, work occurred when we moved to uh, the Center for Cell and Gene Therapy at the Baylor Methodist and Texas Children's Hospital. So we decided to focus here not just on the type 3 latency tumors, but on type 2 latency, which is associated with Hodgkin disease and nasopharyngeal cancer in individuals with an apparently normal immune system. And here these cells express just weak tumor-associated antigens. You've heard about them, LMP1 and LMP2, and are much more difficult targets to make conventional CTLs against. But we found that if we made a recombinant um, adenoviral vector that encoded first LMP2 and then LMP1 and LMP2, uh, we could use this to transduce antigen-presenting cells and overexpress this weak tumor-associated antigen in a pro-inflammatory environment brought about probably by the adenovirus vector and generate T cells that were highly reactive with LMP1 and LMP2. And Kath Bollard will have presented her study um, showing excellent results in patients with uh, relapsed EBV-positive lymphoma in whom almost two-thirds of patients develop a complete response, which was generally sustained, and, to, uh, and a proportion of other patients develop partial responses as well. Interestingly, we can also use these uh, EBV CTLs to treat nasopharyngeal carcinoma, which is a terrible disease once it's a, a diagnosis, but an even more dreadful disease at relapse. And, um, Steve Gottschalk showed that overall, treating patients with relapsed uh, nasopharyngeal cancer, you could get about a 60% two-year survival rate and about a 50% five-year survival rate compared to about 20 and 10% that would be expected by conventional treatment. 
Now, that was encouraging, but what I think is even more encouraging is, and referring back again to the transportability issue, these same results look like they're going to be replicated in another independence center in a different country with a different uh, ethnic group, namely in the National Cancer Center in Singapore, in whom patients who receive either chemotherapy alone or chemotherapy plus EBV CTLs for relapsed nasopharyngeal cancer have a clearly different uh, uh, two-year survival. And if this is sustained, I think these results would be very exciting. Once again, these, these results could be enhanced, we believe, if they were done in the context of a stem cell transplantation for all the same reasons that I mentioned before. I emphasize that up to now, they've been done essentially in patients uh, who have not been transplanted. Another way we can broaden the application of cytotoxic, EBV-specific cytotoxic T cells is by introducing a chimeric antigen receptor, which, as you know, is made from the component parts of, uh, of an antibody molecule, the antigen binding domains of an antibody molecule, coupled to components of the T cell receptor. The idea is you introduce that into a T cell, uh, which then recognizes a tumor-associated antigen and is inspired to kill the tumor cell. Now, up, to, up until quite recently, that hasn't worked very well because those chimeric receptors and the tumor cells don't provide the correct uh, co-stimulatory signals in the correct temporospatial sequence, and they've been a bit of a failure. But we reasoned that one of the ways around that would be to introduce the chimeric receptors uh, into cytotoxic T cells that had as their native specificity Epstein-Barr virus antigens. Instead of a neomycin marker gene, we introduced a chimeric antigen receptor gene, uh, the idea being that these EBV-specific cytotoxic T cells would enter the patient through their native receptor. They'd recognize EBV antigens on antigen-presenting cells, get all necessary co-stimulatory signals. They'd also get helper signals from the CD4 T cells, uh, kill the EBV-infected B cells, and then be primed to go off and through their chimeric receptor, attack the tumor cells. Uh, Helen, uh, again, went through some of this yesterday in her presentation. We studied patients with neuroblastoma who had uh, GD2 positive malignancies. It's a very nice target for attack. It's been validated with the monoclonal antibody studies. And we used two different types of chimeric antigen receptor that had identical specificities but could be distinguished uh, by a small oligonucleotide um, in the sequence. And what we found was that when we gave the cells to the patients, there was very limited persistence and level of the activated T cell population, but a much higher initial level uh, of the uh, uh, CAR expressing cytotoxic T lymphocytes. And this expression was associated with disease responses, including uh, three complete responses. So what we plan to do now is extend this still further and treat patients with other uh, chimeric antigen receptors, uh, for example, to HER2 new. Uh, and treat patients with medulloblastoma, glioma, and non-small cell carcinoma, and those studies have now begun. Once more, this has all been done in the absence of stem cell transplantation, and I believe the combination with stem cell transplantation, for the same reasons, would prove highly beneficial uh, to the uh, effective function of the cells we transfer. Well, can we make all this simpler? Well, now that we've got some good positive results in terms of actually being able to uh, treat patients effectively, we've spent quite a lot of time in process development, which is not something that's easy to fund, but is absolutely essential if this is ever going to be transportable to non-specialist centers. And I think we've been very successful um, in, in achieving a simplification. And as you heard just before, for those of you who were here, Anne Lean, we've also found another way of simplifying things, which is by using third-party off-the-shelf CTLs. For the moment, we're treating patients with intractable virus disease after stem cell transplant, and we're taking cytotoxic T cells that are specific for three viruses, adenovirus, cytomegalovirus, and Epstein-Barr virus. Uh, those that are the most closely HLA matched, we administer uh, to the patients uh, with disease. And because these have already been made, uh, they can be given almost uh, in, uh, as soon as they're required. And uh, for those of you who weren't at her talk, we, we've enrolled 37 patients with CMV, EBV, and adenovirus, one with both CMV and adenovirus. And um, at day 42, there's a more than 80% response rate in terms of disease remission and viral load. So I think this is a, a very encouraging route for treating virus infections, but once again, we can extend it further by making these T cells, allo third-party T cells, specific for tumor-associated antigens, either 
through their native receptors or through chimeric antigen receptors and transfer them again in the context of stem cell transplantation, making it feasible to treat patients with cancers in this kind of off-the-shelf manner. So how do we make them safer? Well, as I said, the scrutiny of, of gene therapy and cell therapy protocols is pretty intense, and, and in some ways this is justified because one of their main selling points is that they are highly persistent and, uh, and can, instead of being excreted like small molecule drugs, uh, they can persist, and in that case, of course, the toxicities can worsen, and we're all very highly familiar with this with graft-versus-host disease. So I think for any broader application of cell therapies in general, not just T-cell therapies, but cell therapies in general, it's going to be essential to have in place an effective safety switch or suicide gene. Now, Chiara Bonini yesterday presented her outstanding results using the uh, herpes simplex thymidine kinase gene, which is very far advanced in clinical study and does seem to work very well in the context of giving allo, uh, allogeneic T cells to patients uh, after stem cell transplant to restore graft versus leukemia activity and antiviral activity. They can be killed, the cells, uh, to prevent graft versus host disease. The problem and limitation with this system is that it works by inhibiting a host DNA cell synthesis in the end. What this means is it's much more effective at killing dividing cells than post-mitotic cells. And even dividing cells, the rate at which they're killed can be relatively slow. It can be days or sometimes even longer than that. Now, that's not a problem in the context that Chiara's uh, using her cells, but it might become a problem in the context in which T cells are being used and other cell types uh, are being used uh, therapeutically elsewhere. So many of the toxicities, it's obvious now, with T cell therapies and potentially with embryonic stem cell therapies are going to be acute and, and prolonged, and not just prolonged. And it's going to be important to have a means of killing the cells that's very rapid indeed. So we've been working on uh, developing a caspase-related system, focusing on, on caspase 9, which is part of the intrinsic or mitochondrial pathway. Normally, this is activated by cytochrome C on APAF1, which uh, dimerizes caspase 9, which in turn uh, interacts with caspase 3 to activate it and trigger the apoptotic pathway. For inducible caspase 9, we substitute a modified FK binding protein domain, which binds a, a bioinert small molecule a chemical inducer of dimerization. So you get dimerization in the presence only of the small molecule, activation only in the presence of the small molecule, splitting of caspase 3, and apoptosis. This has a number of potential advantages which may make it more broadly valuable. It's uh, human-derived, so it should be less immunogenic. It uses a non-therapeutic small molecule, and it should, in principle, be very fast and be equally active on post-mitotic as, as mitotic cells. Uh, this is the construct we use for our clinical study. It's the caspase 9 and FK binding protein domains, plus a, a CD19 um, a marker, which... Uh, that we use to track the cells and sort them so that we get an enriched population. And again, Helen uh, did, did present an outline of these data, but basically the cells, this is just one of, of six, representative of six patients, these cells are able to engraft. CD3, CD19 means that they're the transduced caspase 9 containing cells, so they're not spontaneously dimerizing and spontaneously dying. Uh, they're also functional, at least, unfortunately, in the sense that they can produce graft-versus-host disease, shown here by a rise in bilirubin. But they respond very rapidly, indeed, uh, to a single dose of dimerizer drug. Within 30 minutes, uh, there's a 90% reduction in the number of circulating CD3, CD19, and caspase-positive cells. And with a within a further 24 hours, there's another log reduction. So 99% go within about 24 hours. And there's a similarly rapid fall within about 24 hours of bilirubin in this patient and just the second patient, the similarly rapid response of graft versus host disease, which really does begin to fade quite remarkably uh, within minutes of, of giving the drug. Uh, this is a, a, an agent that we are now adapting for use in, in other cell systems and I think uh, will ensure that the uh, cell therapeutics we use can be controlled very readily should a safety switch be needed. So let, let me summarize this first part in terms of, of showing you that there really is a promised land on the other side of the valley. 
uh, hemopoietic stem cell transplant very clearly is a portal through which these complex biologics can be introduced. Uh, these therapies can be highly effective, they're better, they can be widely adapted individually. I don't think epstein barr virus CTLs are unique in that property, I think that's a, a general feature of complex therapeutics. They can be made much simpler and standardized, maybe even using off-the-shelf agents, and you can have suicide or safety genes uh, to increase the, the, the safety of the, the drugs and increase the confidence of using them. And I think, quite honestly, what are the, are the challenge is going to be over the next five to ten years is finding ways of integrating these complex biologic therapeutics more effectively with stem cell transplantation. And what we're going to need is a, a much more non-toxic way of producing sufficient lymphodepletion that this can become a standard, and, and maybe myelodepletion, so that this can become a standard form of therapy. And monoclonal antibodies are one route to go, but that's, as they say, another story. So who is going to shepherd us through and get us all these products through uh, to the other side of licensure? So what we need is a, is a cadre of clinical researchers who are able to prepare and submit and monitor uh, in investigational new drug applications with the FDA. And they can work either alone in academia or they can work as a sort of academia industry partnership. This is uh, Martin Pule, who holding up one of his uh, IND applications uh, for the, actually for the chimeric antigen receptor. And you can see that there's a considerable amount of work involved in an FDA application. Unfortunately, an FDA application is not the only uh, regulatory hoop through which you have to jump. Uh, this is a, a list of some of the approvals we've had to have from various local and federal regulatory authorities in order to approve other uh, cell and complex biologic therapeutics. Now, I, I want to say, in, emphasize that I'm absolutely not against regulation. The reason I moved from the UK to the States to do the early gene therapy studies was that a framework was present, a regulatory framework was present in the States, which was absent at that time in the UK. So regulation is essential, but this, this is not regulation. This is a, a form of anarchy. It's, it's like being in one of these failed states where a journey of even a few miles is interrupted by, by various militia roadblocks. I mean, that, that, that is an, uh, uh, obviously an exaggeration. Uh, I think you can certainly, and I've certainly been tortured by the wonderfully named NIH RAC, but um, you're, you're not likely to be shot at the NIH because, unlike militia roadblocks, because the NIH installs um, screening and uh, mechanisms at the entrance, which make sure you don't bring weapons in. <laughs> Even if by some miracle there was harmonization of all these uh, various diffuse agencies, uh, the role of the clinical investigator would still be difficult. Uh, it's not just that he or she has to consider human protocols. To be a successful clinical investigator, you have to consider a whole host of other uh, demands on your time and effort. And because many of these investigators are young and, and therefore emotionally immature and, and don't want to listen to advice, some of them take on burdens outside the laboratory that are really quite unnecessary for their work. Now, I actually take this very seriously because we, we had four children and one of the reasons, young children, one of the reasons that we moved to Houston was that community standards in Texas are, are different and they allow you to have very, very effective, uh, safe and, and, and secure childcare at very low cost. So, so how, what does the shepherd really need? The shepherd needs time, needs teamwork, infrastructure, mentoring, and a good economic model to ensure success. Now, teamwork doesn't just mean the, the, the words of teamwork, it means actually rewarding teamwork. It means that the head of department, that the promotion committees, that the grant-giving agencies must all be aware of teamwork and value it and reward it. I must say this is one thing that has got better over the past few years. I think that's, that's in many ways one of the accomplishments, main accomplishments of the Human Genome Project that is made in biological sciences, the concept of teamwork, are highly respectable. Uh, but that's, that's very important and it's always a battle and one that we have to continue to fight, I think. <laughs> 
The other thing you need is infrastructure, and this can be local, for example, regulatory affairs, clinical care cause, and some scientific cause, other administrative cause. But it can also be uh, more generalized. It can also be uh, regional or even national in the form of good manufacturing practice laboratories. As I think we've shown, you can certainly ship out cells that are made in one place and ship out vectors that are made in one place to many other centers and have them simply administer them in much the same way as they would a blood product. So I don't think the issue of complexity of manufacture uh, should be a handicap in developing these further once we show they're effective. And indeed, the NIH has recognized this by funding uh, currently the PACT system uh, for manufacturing cell therapeutics. Mentorship is absolutely critical. I didn't really appreciate that fully until, uh, until I came to the States, but because of the complexity and, and, and huge differences between the kinds of skills that you need to learn to be an effective clinical researcher, it's essential to have mentorship, probably from multiple mentors, each with um, uh, experience in a different area of relevance. And this has to be a prolonged process through many years. And finally, but, but not least, you have to have a good economic route through this valley. Now, I think one of the most important features, and something that's very neglected about biologic therapies, is that they will have, if they work as advertised, very favorable pharmacoeconomics. For many of them, a single dose will be curative, will have minimal side effects, uh, and will ensure a high quality of life for the patient for a very long period of time. We have to be able to capture those benefits and capture them very early on in the development of these agents. We have to show that compared to conventional therapies, they don't just produce longer life and, uh, and, and lower relapse, but that that high life is of a higher quality uh, and requires less medical attention. And I think that's something that we really need to build in in all these studies uh, as we progress. The alternative way, uh, as we're developing those, is the kind of pay-as-you-go model. For example, we can have cost recovery schemes in which we can charge for the cost of manufacturing these, these goods. Uh, commercial entities don't like that for a variety of reasons, but that's perfectly acceptable for most academic centers. If uh, we believe in what we're saying, these therapies really do work better uh, than conventional therapies, we can include the case rates. For example, our patients may receive cytotoxic T cells for the treatment of our infections, and then, uh, thinking about for 35 years, and you may not be able to answer it, but what is the mechanism of tolerance? <laughs> yeah, I'm working on it. <laughs> yes, that's true, actually. I remember that. I, I had forgotten it, but it, it came flooding back when he said it. Horrible sensation. If there are no other questions answered, or, oh, there is a question over here, please. Just, just to help you out, John, with a question. Um, when you, when you say transplant, do you include autologous transplant? Yeah, that, that's a very good question. Um, uh, my, my guess is that it's probably not quite the same for a whole variety of reasons, but um, that would be a good starting point, yeah. <laughs>
Well, if there are no further questions, thank you all very much. Thank you, Malcolm, for a wonderful lecture. Thank you all for your attendance. Have a good evening.